It's time for the show that brings the magic right to your speakers. Ears up! Well, I had to do it to you guys uh, today on the show. I'm wearing a Christmas sweater. I decided to break out the Christmas gear about literally five minutes ago. And uh, I, I just, I don't know, I felt like it. It felt like it was time, Eric. It was time for Christmas. It was time to dawn, to quaff. Quaff? Quake? Mm. Quave? Qu- qu- something. Um, Doesn't quaff mean drink? Yeah, but I think drink, it also like drink the to, Christmas. to like put a thing on. Oh, that. Uh, I don't maybe? know. Yeah. I decided to put a thing on. My, okay. my cool Christmas sweater. There's a kitty riding a pizza that's rocketing through space. And there's Santa hats and a T-Rex. It's just a weird fever dream. NyQuil fever dream, you know what I mean? Yeah, and no, Taryn, I'm not on paid meds again. Uh, <laughs> your husband might be. I don't know. I no, don't know. no, Taryn is not joining us. There's a lot going on. We're gonna oh, we're gonna okay. get into uh, Walt's Night Old Men Part Five today with Eric here, and we're gonna talk about John Throwgood. Is that who it is? Lounsbury. Lounsbury. I love it. I love yeah. it. Um, but Taryn is not joining us. She is up hanging out with Alice right now. Alice is going through something. I don't know what's going on, but she's she's not. I mean, she's. Probably, I guess she's sick, mm. but she's um, she's not feeling. She's not feeling sick. She says she feels fine. Okay. She kind of had a little earache, but there's no fever. There's no nothing, and she's like can't sleep. And she went to bed without dinner, and then she got up and had a bowl of cereal. And anyway, it's a whole parenting Aww. thing. Yeah. yeah. So that's happening upstairs. Um, so Taryn is like, look, I'm just going to be up here. Okay. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I probably I wrote you off the show like a while ago. Like I figured you just weren't going to make it. There's just no way. There's no way. Not with Alice. She's just like, you know, she wants mom and that's fine. That's okay. You know, yeah. It's what happens. And, uh, you know, life goes on, man. Yeah. What are you going to do? Are you okay with that? That she wants mom, not dad? You know, sometimes I'm not. If okay. I'm completely honest with you, yeah. Mm-hmm. Sometimes I'm like, "What the? What's wrong with me?" Like, I'm I'm a comforting person, Eric. When you look at me, do you see what oozes out of me? Uh, I emotions, I, I mean, not physically. Oh, okay. Emotion, emotionally speaking, yes. Yeah. It's clearly comfort, right? Yeah, comfort. Yeah, I mean, no you're sternness. So, you're so tall. Yeah. Patient. And, yes, and um, having never received a hug from you. Yeah, I'm just saying. Um, I would, I would be delighted. I'm delighted. I'm, to- I'm taller in person, probably is what. Than on the than on the video. Well, yeah, I on guess. the video you're like three inches tall. Yeah, and I'm just saying maybe maybe that's my fault. It might be. I want you to get a life size monitor for these shows, please. <laughs> yeah, it's just I don't know, man. It's one of those things that kids go through, and you know what are you gonna do? But yeah. Oh yeah. Um, before we before we get into my story, because I have like a, I have a story of a thing that happened to me today, and I got some really weird friggin' energy today. Part of it is because when Alice is like this, you know, she's like, "Oh, just you know, only, only mom can come for me." She's like almost unconsolable, crying. Hmm. Okay. She's like sobbing and she's sad and she doesn't know why. And I'm like sitting there putting the dishes away, um, and I, I, it's been a while since I've heard this voice, but my anxiety voice flipped on found a channel and mm. was like she knows that you're about to die <laughs> i'm like oh, oh my god <laughs> yeah wow. um so i had to work out of that and that's, that's a voice all right <laughs> yeah um yeah so that's so that's my weird energy but uh before we get to to uh to what happened uh, the past couple of days to me I want to thank our show, our travel uh, partners, Concy Ears. You go to Concy Ears. Thank you. ConcyEars.com right now and learn about the best way. See, now I'm going to like all the live reads that I'd like ever do. The best way to clean and sanitize your brewing equipment is with Concy Ears. You go to <laughs> ConcyEars.com. No, but check them out, especially if you're moving. Into, or we are moving into the holiday season, whether you like it or not. It doesn't matter if you are. It, it does happen. Yes. Yeah. Um, but I've been seeing reports online that the this place is packed. I mean, they have like overflow lines to mansion coming out of the main gate of mansion. Pirates seems like it's always on overflow. So there's so much going on. You, I, I think, especially with this holiday season, you are not going to be able to just go wing it. You're going to need to do some sort of Genie Plus lightning lane thing. And if that freaks you out to high heaven like it does to me, check out the people at Concierge. They will help guide you through all of that information, how to book reservations, how to get Genie Plus. Is it worth it? Where are you going to go? Are you single park or are you park hopping? 
If so, you need to make these reservations. Well, here's how you have to do that. It's a whole process. You basically give them the keys and they can drive your whole trip for you. It's awesome. It's amazing. So check them out, concierge.com. I'm I'm going to Disneyland at maybe the worst time I've ever gone to Disneyland. That's right. You're going in like, what, about a month? Yeah. I'm nice. going on the, the 21st, 22nd, and 23rd. I'm also going to Knott's on the 23rd. Oh. You're going, you're going I'm, Christmas week, and I'm flying home on Christmas Eve. I have Brother. never, I have never flown on Christmas Eve. It, it weirdly enough, flying out of John Wayne on Christmas Eve is cheaper than cheaper than flying to Anaheim on the twenty first. Uh, but uh, yeah, this was kind of an accident. It sounds like it's going to be more of an accident. It's about to be a bigger accident than you think, man. <laughs> what happened? How did you just accidentally decide to go to Disneyland? I mean, you're like three states away. Yeah, Dan and I were a friend of the show, Dan. Uh, and oh, yeah, I were right. going to we're going to go to uh, Disneyland the week before. And I went on to one of these. I'm like, I'll be smart. I'm going to go on one of these DVC uh point rental places because i had just rented out some of my points because i had some extra extra dvc points to to rent out great experience renting out the points and getting paid for it but i thought well wh why not try to stay at the tower the new the new disneyland hotel oh, tower okay and um i found uh, i found a room I'm like wow that's that's great and like i was at work when i found it and went well I don't I don't want to do the whole thing right now. I don't want to like I, I'm at work. Let's just get back to work and do the work. And I went home. Yeah. That's much more fun than planning a vacation. Right, right. <laughs> but I but I went home that night and I went in again and wasn't paying attention. And this particular site, when uh... it doesn't so the inventory had sold out by the time I got home. And instead of saying, no, we don't have things for the dates that you're going, yeah, it, it said. How about this? <laughs> and you said yes. <laughs> and I went, wow, it's even cheaper. I can't believe it. It's several hundred dollars cheaper than it was when I checked earlier today. It's also a week later, and it's um, the days before um, Christmas. <laughs> so I'm actually surprised it was cheaper, to be honest with you. Well, it was cheaper because it's one day less than the end. Oh, okay. I was looking All at right. three nights, and then I saw it, when it came up, it was two nights. Yeah. So yes, it was less, and um, yeah, I I did something stupid, and I just went, great, click, pay for it, and then when they sent me the confirmation email, I'm like, great, I'm <laughs> I'm doing all right, and then three <laughs> days later, I looked back at the confirmation, and went, those are the wrong dates. <laughs> See, I tried to pull this when I order stuff for my with my wife's card, you know, and it's like I didn't mean to order all of these plant lights, but <laughs> tee -hee -hee, it just happened, I guess. Yeah, well, I went to buy two and I bought twelve. Yeah, so now we need to buy more plants. There you go. The store. Yeah, but that's very yeah, funny though. Yeah, it, so I'm I'm doing a vacation that's mostly on my own. Dan and I, Dan is going to come up, and we're going to go to Knotts one night, cool, or one day. Yeah. I'm on the 23rd. So if you'd like to join us at Knott's, you can come on the 23rd. Or if you'd like to join me at Disneyland, if you're in the area on the 21st and 22nd, and probably also the 23rd, uh, <laughs> why not? Like, yeah. just just hit me up. Uh, we'll be we'll be around because um, Dan's pass is blacked out those dates, so he can't come up the whole time. But but yeah, instead of why not, it's why not? Why not not? Uh -huh. There you go. It's a joke that's never yeah. been made before. Uh, yes, I don't well, get it, but well, hey. That's very exciting. I'm, I'm glad that you're going. I'm glad that it's a thing that's happening to you and not to me, because that sounds utterly miserable. <laughs> I'm going to find out. But bless, man. Please let me know. Please I've been there in early breath. December. This is the latest in December I've ever yeah, been that's... at a Disney park. Yeah. I think you'll be fine. I probably will. Yeah. I, mean, I mostly tend to like find a place to eat and drink <laughs> well got to make reservations for that i suppose i'm already on it <laughs> <laughs> all right so i gotta here's before we start you before we start the show proper i gotta tell you i gotta tell you what's going on in my life i have yeah. to do it so you know i think i may have told you we've talked to you know whatever i'm looking for like a job 
Um, you know, part of uh, it being a contract worker and then, you know, just kind of uh, my industry podcast editing or whatever sort of, you know, it's not as lucrative as it used to be, I suppose. And uh, I'm just sort of tired of being a contract worker. I want a job with a thing, with a, with a salary, with a, you know what I mean? Yeah. I still want to yeah. do this, but like, I don't want, I don't know. I just want something new. I want something different. Okay. So I've been applying for jobs for months, man. And it is, uh, you know, but in the same industry of podcasts, right? Like podcast editing or, you know, podcast production or some something there. But it could also be I've also tried customer service and I've tried community management and, mm -hmm. pro and um, project management and stuff like that. But my, you know, my um, I don't know, my resume doesn't really reflect what it would take to get some of these jobs I've been applying to, but I just okay. do it anyway because I, yeah. I need to do something. I need to feel like I have forward progression, right? So I've, I, I've applied, you know, you, you go on like LinkedIn and then you find a job post on LinkedIn, but then it says apply to this other website, but you have to log into a third website, which is like Indeed or, you know, mycareers.com or whatever it is, and then you can apply. So I have accounts with so many job websites now, and I'm just applying to stuff left and right, and I don't keep track of what I'm applying to. Okay. I didn't think you would need to do that. I just I didn't think that in the world of applying for jobs, like the scams were like a big thing. But I got the a text scams. a couple Ooh, yeah. weeks ago. Yeah, I got a text from someone like, oh, you applied for this job. I'm like, oh, and I sort of went back and forth and like, well, we can meet you right now with the CEO of our company, Mr. Weijong Zhang. And I'm like, OK, fine. That's cool. On Signal. You have to download the Signal app, which is like a secure version of a message, like WhatsApp or whatever. Okay. And then how long will it take for you to create an account? I'm like, eh, beep, 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 beep. You know, the, the little flashing light in my head's going on. I'm like, no, Ugh. thanks. Thank you, but no, thank you. I'm just going to, and I just blocked the number. I'm like, that's not, that's not, you know, valid. But yeah, who, who, yeah, you don't, you shouldn't have to like join another app just to right. have an interview. Well, right. And also the CEO, and it happened to be a, oddly enough, because Taryn works in the same industry, it happened to be a, a, a company out of New Jersey that does senior living. Okay. So I'm like, oh, okay, that's funny. And I looked up the website and it's like a legit thing. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. But the person wouldn't, uh, you know, send me the job posting, wouldn't tell me any more about the job. And it was 35 bucks an hour part time for data entry. I'm like, I don't remember applying for this, but I might have because it depends on on if I'm up or down chemically, you know. Um, okay. I'm applying for I'm applying for data entry jobs. You know. Well, yeah, I mean? you're just going for it. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So I get an email the other day, and it's this person from this company, CoStar, and they're like, "Oh, thanks for applying for a voiceover artist," which I I have done some of those too, and uh, you know we we like to. Uh, move on to the next stage so here is a um it's a questionnaire it's like a 10 question questionnaire and it was really like insightful it was like a really good questionnaire um you know it was like um you know in your experience as a voiceover artist what would you do if a client came back to you and wanted you to adjust your tone to match more of their brand i'm like oh, that's a really good question okay that's, that's specific specific yeah. very specific right and it's uh they said they were located in sacramento the header was like you know blah 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 west sacramento blah 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 and i go to the website and they're like legit it's costar is a legit company but they're doing um a lot of real estate data for some reason and in this in the in the email they were like oh yeah you know for video games and whatever i'm like maybe they're branching out i don't know when you're job hunting you can sort of excuse any red flag that you see okay because it could be something else right like you look up eventually i looked up their address and they weren't there was nobody by that name in the building that came up but i'm like well maybe they just moved in and they're just making a push into west sacramento and like whatever right so you, you can kind of like you can kind of see where it's, it's like it's building it's good yeah. you could have whatever but maybe and so yeah and um the salary was more than money than i've ever made yearly in my entire life i mean it was it was it was like 60 bucks an hour eight hours a day and i'm like this is odd that's really cool but i'm i'm not going to get excited about it because something just i was like until i start i and get my first check i'm not going to be excited about this i'm okay. going to be reserved about it so i fill out the paperwork send it in the next day they go oh oh also i needed to take a picture of my id for approval 
purposes. I'm like, okay, sure, I can do that. And Taryn was like, you know, because I'm talking to her about it, because I'm like, I think this might be weird. I don't know. And she goes, well, but what's the scam? And I go, I don't know. And what's the worst that can happen? They get your information off of your ID no matter what. If someone wants to get your information, they'll, they'll get it. It's, it's out there. It's like, whatever. I'm like, ah, okay, fine. I guess you're right. It's not like you're emailing them your or, or sending them your physical social security card in the mail. Please right. keep it. Here's three credit cards as well. Yeah, right. So <clears throat> I'm like, okay, and I'm, I'm reading the, the offer letter again. And it's like something about, uh, you know, we want you to start on Monday. And, you know, no interview. There's no actual like spoken interview. There's no, hey, send me your reel, your demo reel. So they haven't heard your voice. As far as I know. For, so, for a VO job. Correct. Full time, $112,000 okay. a year. And I'm like, I'm thinking, I'm trying hard not to be like, man, I could really, I can get some new racks for my studio, which I really want to do. We can get out of credit card debt. Like I can like, you know, we can just do stuff we want to do. I can, I can hire an electrician and put a new outlet over. You know what I mean? Like this, that kind mm -hmm. of stuff. Right. But I'm like, nope, I got to. <clears throat> anyway. And then they were like, oh yeah. And you know, maybe we'll send you a check to buy like a laptop and whatever. And I'm like, okay. And I just sort of like skimmed through it, but the check always kind of stood out and Taryn mentioned it too. And I'm like, yeah, but what is that? What is, I'm not going to give my bank information. So I called my buddy, Ted, who I did a, a, a cool people doing cool things episode on Patreon. He is the sports caster guy, my buddy. Ted. Oh, him. Yeah. Um, and you know, he, because he sort of works in the same arena, I suppose. No, no sports pun intended. And um, he's like, what's the worst that could happen? What's the, he goes, I, I'm, I'm looking up this, but I can't find the flaw. I can't find a scam yet. Mm -hmm. So what's the worst that could happen? I'm like, you know what, Ted, you're right. I'm like, but is this out of the realm of reality for pay? And he goes, no. He goes, I did like a 20 minute VO job for someone. I got paid three grand. Like it's, it, the VO work is expensive. It's like starting at 250 an hour. So they're probably giving you, they're probably going, oh, we can get a deal off this guy. I'm like, you know what? Yeah, that's right. They can probably get a deal off me. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> They're underpaying me, but I'm in for it. <laughs> but I'm in for it. Yeah, because it's life-changing money, right? So, yeah. So I was like, I just don't, I don't get it. So I sent her a question, the the, the person who uh, who sent me the email. Um, I was like, hey, I have a, I have a, a couple follow-up questions. Can we jump on a call for five minutes? And I go, by the way, I looked up this person's name. No person like this exists for this company. They're, you know, it says they're HR, but whatever. And uh, she's like, well, I'm too busy. I can't actually get on a phone call with you, but I'm happy to email you in person. I'm like, I don't know. So then Taryn finds this website, CoStar, and then there's actually a section in their careers page that says like scam alert. Oh, and she sends it to me and I'm like, my stomach just went down to the knees, man, because it's like, we will only email you from CoStar.com. And this was careers at CoStar. No, careers, CoStar.com. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, OK, cool. We will never ask for your ID as proof, of, you know, for of employment. And I'm like, OK, well, that's strike two. <laughs> and so mm -hmm. I uh, they had a um, an email address recruiting at coaster.com so i emailed them i forwarded them that email i was like hey i i don't know what to think anymore hopefully this is like a thing but i have a feeling it's not real i just want to verify and i heard this morning that it's a, a totally like not a, a thing it's a total scam and i just i wanted to bury myself man it was so tough I, yeah i bet yeah tough like you're, and you're I try trying not, not to, to be invested, it, but but you can't help it. You absolutely can't yeah. help it. And I mean, I thought this was like this, you know, coming to Christmas and like this is just it. It was just it was at the right time. Everything was hitting at the right time. And um, yeah. And uh, anyway, so I uh, I was like, well, shoot, I signed an, a, a, an acceptance letter. What does that mean or whatever? And Terrence like, you should probably just email them and tell them no. So. I was like, I, you know, resend my acceptance letter. This job just isn't working out for me. And I haven't heard anything back. <laughs> they haven't heard anything back. And then I think what would happen, and I posted on the uh, sub, uh, scams subreddit, and someone's like, they would probably send you a check. 
and then they would want some of it back or the check would bounce or something like that. So it's a hmm. check scam. So that was the point where they're looking for job seekers and then they're going to set them up with a whole like MacBook and whatever. And either you're just on the hook for it because it's funny or you're, it's some sort of like, oh, we overpaid you. Send me five hundred dollars in iTunes gift cards. <laughs> Okay. And then, and then you have a new MacBook that you can't pay for because you need a job, anyways. Right. And, and you have no job, but you have a new MacBook that you can't return. Ugh. Yeah, it's awful. It, it's just it's such a bad like vibe, man. And so all day I've just been this bad vibe. It makes me want to cry. Like it just it's like openly just weep. It's atrocious. And uh, but you know, say la vie, man. You got to do what you got to do. You know. No, that I mean that really that really really sucks. I've never had anything like that happen, but I I got I got fished once on the phone. Like, oh yeah, just uh blah 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 and insurance for your credit card and all this stuff and I remember it, this was in college and my roommate's like, "What are you doing? Did you just give somebody <laughs> your credit card number?" I'm like, "Oh crap, I did." <laughs> and had to get a lawyer involved and all this stuff, but Ooh. and that that felt that felt gross. I can o- like I can only imagine like that feeling amplified like one hundred fold for you. Yeah, because I I I was and like I said in the beginning, you can excuse away anything. And my the thing I kept coming back to was why would somebody take their time? And they probably just like stole this questionnaire from the actual co star group because they actually do. They have postings right now for voiceover artists, but it's, okay. they're, in, they're in Virginia. Okay. It's not remote. And I'm like, well, mm. I got a whole studio. I, can, I mean, this is what I do anyways. Like I right. do, I do commercials. So like whatever. Right. And I say commercials, like it's like a big thing, but they're literally for other podcasts. Um, mm. But I'm like, why would someone develop this questionnaire and have me send it out to me? I guess it's really to really set that hook. That was the thing I kept coming back to. It's like it can't be a scam because they have this questionnaire and it's there, uh, insightful and focused and pointed. And this is what I would expect of a company. That's a long con. Yes, it is. And then just to, there's no, there's no maybe because I pushed back a little bit to like because so when when I was talking to Taryn, uh, I was like, look, I what I don't want to do is call them out and say this is why I think you're scamming me because it in my mind I would just be helping them. Because mm-hmm. there were some things thinking about it now where it's like, oh, you, you said I would start in Pacific, but then you give me times in, in in Eastern. And so which is accurate and you have some like a thing here that's not right. And you have just this other there's stuff, there's stuff that it just didn't add up. Um, yeah. But, you know, it's not that I was like blinded by it because I knew to temper my expectations. I knew it. I friggin knew it, man. Whatever. <sighs> But that's well, it. So I got some weird energy today, Eric. Hey, that's that's just fine. And yeah, it is. That, that only really fine. sucks. That's like epic. <laughs> that's epic suck. Like, holy Dude. cow, man. Yeah, it is. And, you know, going through, if you just like search scam in Reddit, because like looking for some some subs to post this in, just so other mm-hmm. people don't. Actually, I might, I should probably find a voiceover sub and post that too, because it's like, you know, they're targeting that's fair, that yeah. community, right? Um, but this one person's like, it just in, the, I think it's in, in scams in the actual like subreddit scams where someone was like, yeah, am I being scammed here? Um, because, uh, you know, I got an email from Apple saying they need to buy cryptocurrency on my account <laughs> to help draw out a, a hacker. <laughs> Everyone's like, yeah, yeah dude. A, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's a little more obvious. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. All right. Well, enough about me, Eric. Let's talk about John. John. Yes. Let's talk about John. John Lonsberry. We're just going to dive right in here. Let's do it. Okay. Uh, this is our fifth foray into the realm of Waltz Nine Old Men. Uh, lest listeners forget, this is a series started by Terrence um, 17 years ago. <laughs> We've been working on this for a while. Speaking uh, of Terrence, I just I will make I will interrupt to make an announcement. Both Terrence and Beverly. As well <gasps> as Jeremy, oh, will be on our Christmas show on the fourteenth of December. You guys, oh, all right, um, our Santa Iger letters. Yes, yeah, so and they are going to do Santa Iger letters, and I think Jeremy is going to do one as well. 
And you know how that boy gets when he wants to write letters to people. <laughs> it's going to be great. So speaking of Terrence, so much rhyming. Yeah, <laughs> Terrence will be coming back <laughs> along with Bev. And I think, I believe, Terrence and Bev will also be staying for the secret show that night as well. Ooh. Yes. Okay. So that will be fun. Anyway, All right. continue, please. And it, yes, that's great. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, but yes, so Walt's Nine Old Men. This is the group of animators that Walt relied on during the studio's kind of second act after after all those, uh, you know, little kitty cartoons when he upgraded to films, feature length um, animation. Uh, these were his these were his guys. Uh, he named them jokingly after President Ro- Roosevelt's jab at the Supreme Court. And um, these these nine old men dragged Disney Studios from clever cartoons about a crass little mouse into legitimate film. And John, John, John Lounsbury, John Lounsbury. He's from, he's from Philly. John, John Lansbury. The John. Yeah. <laughs> John Lounsbury was uh, not the most well known of this crew. He was uh, he's not on any windows on Main Street. What? He was a shy man who pretty much got his work done and then went home. So just it, you know, not a not a giant personality like Milt Call that I talked about last time who would get angry and yell at everybody and try to make them work harder. Uh, are the are the nine old men? Is that like a thing in the Disney company, or is it just like fans call them that? And that's kind of, I mean, I know you said Walt it was like a mm-hmm. like a joke, but it, it's like it's like there's rumors that I, that I've heard about uh, Rolly Crump, who that like mm-hmm. the Imagineers, the artists didn't like him because he didn't go to art school, mm-hmm. and he never really got his due because of that, because they were just sort of snooty because they all were trained, and he just. He was this flashy dude who just happened to be weird and do good stuff. But yeah, um, so he never really got the uh, acceptance that he deserved, clearly. And uh, I just wondered if if that was, you know, something like the studios didn't really go, oh, the nine old men, because I would think that if you're in that nine old men club, you got a window you, by by default. You have to get a window. Well, and that's kind of it. it. Most of the several of the nine old men ended up working for WED. Mm. And that's how they got their windows. Ah, okay. Is they were involved with the the making of the park. So some of these folks, like Wooly Reitherman, um, was involved with with the making of the parks, and we'll talk about Wooly eventually. Um, I, you know, I think Wooly was one of the first. Is does Wooly have a, in my blanket? In, am I thinking of somebody else? No, uh, no, I'm thinking of Waffle Rogers. That's who has. <laughs> Wooly, Never mind. Rothel, uh, you know. weird old names. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, some of these guys did end up working for WED, uh, like Mark Davis. Mark Davis is probably the most famous one of the nine old men who yeah. made the swap over to WED. And um, yeah, some of these these other guys just stayed in animation and they didn't involve get involved with the parks. They stayed right on course with what they knew. Um, but yeah, it, I mean, this, this kind of second group of of animators they were generally trained as cartoonists they did attend art school uh, by and large and like Lounsbury is one of these people he went to multiple art schools and uh yeah like some of the original guys who came in they were just people who were talented at drawing and Walt said here come on let's go and those were his his young men that he replaced relied on and as he started to up the stakes as he started to push animation forward he involved he brought in educators to teach these these guys who didn't have formal art training how to be better at what they were doing and Mm -hmm. they were kind of overtaken in time and that was one of the big schisms in 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 the studios that's part of what caused the strike is uh, things started to split people were were more skilled at art and they and some of the the guys that were doing well that had pioneered animation were getting left behind in the dust and weren't getting paid the way that they thought they were but that's a totally different story (laughs) (laughs) i'm speaking off off the cuff here um 
and I would like to talk about the strike at some point. Um, I keep mentioning that every time I do one of these, but, but yeah, anyway, John Lounsbury. Uh, yeah, he was a shy guy. He, he came in, he did his work, he went home, but his impact on the studio and its, its product, its animation uh, is indelible. He became one of the hardest working animators the company ever saw. Uh, John was born in in 1911 on March 9th in Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, his family moved him to Colorado uh, when he was five years old, and he attended um, East Denver High School, which still exists. Uh, his uh, father died when he was 13, and things got kind of tough, so he started working. He started working for the school. He was doing cartoons. He sold his art, uh, and he... According to one report, his art was on almost every single page of the the annual yearbook. Jeez. Yeah. Like this guy just drew. When he graduated, he was briefly a rail, railroad worker. But then he went to the Art Institute of Denver, which is also still in existence. Um, after he graduated from there, he moved out west. Uh, his His contemporaries, his classmates encouraged him to move out west to yeah. la which is still there yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. la is still there <laughs> yeah, as much as we may not want it to be sometimes <laughs> still there still there he attended the art center college of design in la and after a little bit of uh, additional time there one of his teachers suggested that he go to apply at disney studios he applied at Disney Studios. He got a job on July 2nd, 1935, and he stayed there forever. God, that's his, cool. His I entire mean, career. That's got to be a good feeling that your teacher was like, hey, why don't you go work at Disney? Why don't you get a job there? Right. I mean, clearly you're good enough. And obviously you need a training or whatever because he's just in you know school. But I don't know. That's got to feel good as a kid. To like yeah. get that, that much reinforcement. You, you think I'm that good? Where I could be, you know, I have the jump. I have the talent to make that jump. Right. A young 20-something guy, like, here, you can go to. The, these guys are, they're on the cutting edge. They're making yeah. they're making cartoons about trees that go like this and wave their arms around. <laughs> it's a wacky, inflatable <laughs> tree guy. Uh, he married his sweetheart, Florence, soon after he started out at Disney Studios. And everything was looking Lounsbury after that. Okay, I love it. Um, Andreas Deha, who uh, is one of the one of the Disney Renaissance animators who worked on characters like Roger Rabbit and Gaston, it, it is like obsessed with Lounsbury. He's written mm -hmm. multiple great things about this guy. He said that it, that Lounsbury, it, he was one of he was a a mentor to him. Um, he said he John really liked characters that he could sink his teeth into. He updated the old squash and stretch of old cartoons. That's when, when you know, walking, you you know, a character like something would... you hear on botched. <laughs> you, gotta, you gotta get rid of this old squash and step or whatever you said. <laughs> squash and stretch. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, you know, it's it's when it, when characters could be a little bit fluid, and that was part of the comedy of it is that they would do things that are exaggerated, and and big. Uh, more emotive because they could actually move around. And that was one of those hallmarks of Disney animation is that the characters suddenly became more emotive. It wasn't just here is a cartoon mouse. He hit something with a thing. It, there were, there were, you, you could tell that there were emotions happening in this animation. Um, I wonder how much that is, is played off of, um, <clears throat> you know, using maybe stage actors as, um, as reference points versus just like, oh, I think I'm going to do this because, you know, they say you can always tell someone who who has uh, trained in theater versus for film because their actions are really big. Mm -hmm. They react really big because you need to see that. You know, right. like you're going to play. You need to see it from 50 feet away, 100 yeah, feet away. Right. And so on on TV, you don't have to. So you're more subtle. Mm -hmm. You're you're definitely on point there because a lot of original animation, a lot of the a lot of the first generation animators for Disney based their work on vaudeville. Okay. So they see these vaudeville actors and they're like, we can do this with a cartoon. Yeah. And the next stage was, I mean, 
upgrading to Snow White was a massive improvement because you were trying to go for film. You're trying to go for uh, the stately queen who who's, <laughs> you know, looks like a human being. You know, that was that was yeah. a major change. Yeah. Uh, so Lounsbury incorporated a lot of this squash and stretch into his animation that continued through from continued into years later uh you think of the elephants in jungle book and the way that they they move the, the way they bounce as they walk and um uh, think of tony in the lady and the tramp uh when he's playing the accordion when he's emoting to his business partner joe i have a clip here that is uh, potentially ready <laughs> if you if you got the link if you sure, didn't brother, i can no. vamp longer no i got it it's fine let's see if we're gonna share sound we're also gonna optimize for a video clip all right yeah that's what we're doing here boys we're yeah we're check it out this is a quick little clip that goes yeah. from lonsberry's original sketches into the final animation see but the problem is now i have it uh you know sharing my youtube page and then on the on the right now, I want to see the Delorean racing through things right. and old. I want to see all the, all the stuff. Yeah, some that, of these uh, look pretty good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> means we got to do a walkabout soon. Why can't I? Um, I'm not gonna stretch it out. Okay, here we go. There we go. Tonight the butcher he's a get. Tonight the butcher he's a get. Tonight the butcher he's a get. It's a little repetitive because it's a very short clip. Butcher, he's a get. Tonight, so what is the? the uh, it's the. Uh, what the chef of the Italian restaurant and leading the tram? Yeah, yeah. So they were showing the uh, original sketches, and then how it translated into the original film, and it's just spot on. Right, and he's yeah. he's just such a big emotive character. His arms are moving so much, and you've we've all seen this. And I suppose there are probably longer sketches that would that would do this better. Uh, but but yeah, he's. This is what Lounsbury was known for, is creating emotion, creating characters that were relatable, that were interesting to watch yeah. uh, with his with his work. Uh, the animator um, Dale Bear, who was also trained by Lounsbury, said that Lounsbury was the only person he knew who animated with a carpenter's pencil. Mm. Now, you've seen... you've you've probably seen these i mean my dad's a carpenter so i grew up with these but that's the like square pencil that has like a quarter inch piece of lead in it yeah that you get yeah. at home depot Put so it behind he would... your ear it's like look like a two by four right right yeah. um so he was he would actually animate with this so uh, here's the quote from from dale he would roughly block in with the wide flat part of the pencil and then when he found the line he wanted he would put in the thinner pencil John wasn't one of those guys that demanded that this or that happens or acted out all of his scenes for all the other fellows. He showed up at eight, he did his thing, and he left at five. He did his day's work, but his family was just as important to him. Yeah, bless this man's heart. <laughs> like, that is how everybody should be. I put, look, man, I put in my hours. I'm, I'm gone. I got things to do that don't involve, you know, staying late. Right. Yeah, screwing around with the rest of the guys, having a bunch of drinks. No, just I'm going home. I'm done. Yeah, right. Uh, Frank Thomas and Ali Johnston, who um, were also uh, two of Walt's nine old men, uh, wrote in their book that John could always make a funny observation in the worst situations. Even though he was a quiet, shy guy, uh -huh. he'd, he'd have that joke ready when when you needed it the inappropriate joke or like it was like funny because no it sounds like it was yeah probably in in in, <laughs> okay. in fair in good taste okay all right all right that's different then <laughs> all right um but yeah it, this guy animated on everything from when he started until he left the company uh he has he's credited on basically every short every movie everything that the studio did that was significant from when he came in um, in 1935. Uh, so when he started, he was assigned to Norm Ferguson, uh, Fergie Ferguson, uh, one of Walt's original stalwarts. Uh, so he was an assistant animator to Fergie. I like how and, he already had a short first name, but they needed to give him another it, nickname. Not It couldn't right. just be Norm. It had to be Fergie. I'm sure Walt was like, nope. 
uh, uh, how about Fergie? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, he came in with uh, with Fergie, who taught him how to create animated characters that told a story with emotion and movement. And uh, yeah, he started out on, on a few Pluto shorts where he helped out um, with supporting animation on those. He was an uncredited assistant animator on Snow White. That was his first big job. And what a big job. He was working on The Witch. So Fergie and John worked on The Witch herself. Wow. Where they were told, this this character needs to be the exact opposite of the stately, unemotive queen. She needs to be emotional. She needs to be ugly. She needs to be scary. And they got it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah absolutely um and he got to john himself got to animate the sequence where the witch is descending into the cellar and closing a trap door over her head where she's like staring out creepily the entire way down uh but he got to do that entire sequence himself he wasn't just doing in-betweens uh then john and fergie went on to work on pinocchio they animated honest john and gideon the cat and they decided that rather than make them a serious and sinister pair, uh, they wanted to add humor. So they made Gideon this mute and silly cat that is just dumb and just wants to hit things with his club. Same. And Same. <laughs> and Honest John was this sly huckster fellow. So they they created these two opposing characters. And this is something that John carried forward even after he wasn't working with with Fergie is creating opposing characters in the same scene uh he became the a full animator credited in Dumbo where he animated some of the scenes with Dumbo and Timothy Mouse not any of the sad scenes where Dumbo's crying or anything like that <laughs> no the cool scenes where Dumbo is drunk nice. um <laughs> and he so it, there were there are other animators like Bill Titla who did most of the Dumbo animation, but uh, John got to do the the less serious things where there were more visual gags like Dumbo hiding behind his ears and things like that. Um, moving on from there, he went to Fantasia. John, in a very rare interview, said that Fantasia was one of his favorite projects because. <laughs> It was the first time he had to animate with uh, with music in mind. So he was animating in the Dance of the Hours segment. He was animating the, the alligator. This is the dance between the alligator and the hippo. And he realized he had to be way more precise than he ever had been before because he had to stick with the tempo and he had to meet the, the tone of that particular point in, in the song. So thinking about tempo and beat was a really special challenge that he really enjoyed very mm. much. So he really came to be known as an animal animator guy. Um, after that, he did Br'er Fox and Br'er Bear in Song of the South. Again, wow. two very different characters that were often in the same scene. One kind of, you know, sly and mis mischievous and the other one, the bumbling, you know, bear who just wants to, you know, do what he's told and get out of the, get out of here and go sleep. It's, it's it sounds like a, a a lot to keep straight in your head. Yeah, like that sounds like a lot of brain power. You know what I mean? Like that's th yeah, that's that's some work, man. <clears throat> Ooh. Uh oh, are you okay? Uh oh, uh oh, yep. Breathe, breathe that whole glass of water right there. There you go. <laughs> that's great. Um. Under but, the sea. But yeah, it's it is a lot to think about. Um, and it's it's gotta be a, a special challenge. If this is what you're good at, and and showing that you can do two completely different characters and show different personalities in the same scene, that's gotta feel good. Y you know, yeah, that's absolutely that's going off your craft. That's that's yeah. really bragging on screen. Well, uh next up was uh the giant in fun and fancy free, who might be a big dumb big dumb guy but but he's but uh john still Im imbued thought and emotion into him as he's talking you can see that the giant is thinking about things and pondering things uh, but then we're back to music and animals in melody time and saludos amigos where he had several sequences and um 
yeah, it, after that, it's it's more it, it just gets assigned various scenes in in everything. He got to animate uh, Ichabod Crane in a few se- sequences in that movie. Nice. Then we get to the big leagues here again. We're doing music and animals all over again. It's Cinderella. He animated all of the animals in the carriage transformation scene. Um, so he didn't he didn't do the full the full Cinderella transformation. He wasn't doing that, but he was doing all of the, you know, mice and 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 such being turned into horses and all of that. Um, it is funny he, because you do just on the surface, like you don't really think about these scenes having mm-hmm. specific artists. Right, right. Them, right. It's like it's like having five directors work on one movie where it's like, well, I did this action shot and then. Frank did the drama scenes and then Bill did the sex scenes because he's a pervert. You know what I mean? Like there's, I don't know, like that's interesting. Every time I'm reminded that there were just individuals doing this. Right. You can't have somebody draw every single Cinderella scene because they'd never get it done. And these things took years anyway. So yeah, you definitely had, yeah, it's interesting to hear that he did. Well, he did this specific scene when the animals transformed into other animals he did the mice during their songs so when they're singing you know about about cinderella uh, and that was his chance to do animals again and singing um syncing up to a musical track um uh, some of this was apparently uh, was apparently credited to ward kimball who is uh, possibly our next old man Ward's one of my favorites, so I've got a ton of stuff on Ward. So it's I'm doing more research on him, uh, okay. but it, some of this got credited to the wrong guy. Um, oh, Happens. yeah, because John was a background guy. He did filler stuff. He did he did a few emotional scenes and let the other guys create the characters and let the other guys uh, direct the scene, as it were. Um, Alice in Wonderland. He animated the Rose and most of the Cheshire Cat Hmm. animation. But again, Ward Kimball was the one credited for the Cheshire Cat because he created the design. But John did most of the actual work on the Cheshire Cat. Wow. Isn't that the way, man? And I wonder if he wasn't so quiet. Yeah. I wonder wonder if that would have happened. Or it's just, well, Ward did the design. And then so it sort of gets translated maybe in an interview or something like that. And then now he's just credited with it. Yeah, who knows? Because Ward Ward was a personality. Ward was yeah. the guy who put in a lot of work and then would goof off the rest of the day because he was talented and he was skilled. And yeah, but John John was talented and skilled, but he just did his work and he got out of there. Maybe he didn't cause a ruckus. I don't know. Uh, finally, he draws a human. Uh, in Peter Pan, he, he uh, designed George Darling. Wendy's all the kids father Mm -hmm. Uh, so not the most important character but he had some good scenes at the beginning of the movie sure yeah absolutely he he got to animate him in formal wear with a suit and a cape and a walking stick and a hat and swinging around and billowing in the the London breeze like really really interesting stuff where he's this guy's sarcastic but he's also a little bit scared of this Peter Pan because he remembers Peter Pan Oh, sure. Um, so you could, there's a, so much in these little early scenes. Um, and that was him. Lady That's in the cool. Tramp. Yeah. Uh, Lady in the Tramp. He animated several scenes again. Definitely more dogs. <laughs> right. Uh, he drew, he drew a few people. He drew a, a police constable. If you remember at the beginning when, when uh, the Tramp is kind of trying to get into the zoo and, there's a constable yelling at this like bespectacled gentleman and the tramps there playing around with them. And it's kind of the intro of lady and the tramp. Um, but, uh, but yeah, he, he animated that scene, but like we had earlier in the episode, his triumph in this uh, considered his triumph by multiple subsequent Disney artists was doing the Italian restaurant scene with Tony and Joe the owner and the cook at the Italian restaurant. So Andreas Deha again says that this is his best work. John Pomeroy, another Disney animator uh, who worked at both Disney and the Bluth studios later, he would go back to John's original drawings to learn from them. He wasn't directly taught by John, by John. John, Oh, nice. But, 
he would refer to his drawings to see how he did it. Um, and John stated uh, the, uh, that that uh, Tony and Joe were so great and Italian looking, you could smell them on the screen. Gee. <laughs> and what does that mean? Because is that B.O.? Is that garlic? Is that like what kind of like stereotype are we providing? <laughs> right, exactly. Right here. What's going on? Uh, but yeah, uh, like it, you can he, smell the. <laughs> let's let's say it was the the spaghetti that he's lab- ladling onto a plate. Sure, um, but yeah, I mean it's such a great scene. Like you see Tony getting all upset because it, he he's trying to feed these two dogs, and Joe comes out with a bunch of bones. He's like, "Bones, no, you, they want spaghetti." <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but yeah, exaggerated movements again. Back to that squash and stretch utilized to amazing effect to create emotion and create drama and interest in these characters. These characters are barely in the movie, but right. what scene do we remember from this movie? It's that the one spaghetti scene, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. After this, uh, Joe becomes kind of a shapeshifter. He, uh, he's assigned to sleeping beauty where many of the characters were designed by Milt call who was on our last nine old men episode. Uh, a lo- some of the animators had already left. Some of them had left the studio. Some of them had left to go to Wed, and Milt was kind of left to design a lot of the a lot of the look of the film, along with um, Ivan Earl, uh, who kind of designed a lot of those the blocky trees in the backgrounds and mm-hmm. the color palette and things like that. Yeah. So these two guys kind of set the the theme, the the tone for the movie, which was different from a lot of the other earlier animation. And Lounsbury showed off his skills by adapting his animation style to Milt's. So it, Lounsbury designed Maleficent, Maleficent's goblins or goons or whatever they're they're considered. They're they're still cartoony for the most part, but uh, think of the horse Samson, mm-hmm. uh, who was had that angular style that fit with that fit with Prince Philip. Um, he does he. John was involved was the the principal on the horse Samson. He also d- did the entire sequence between Kings Hubert and Stefan. Um they're cartoony but still angular and they're they're having fun. This is a great sequence where they get all dramatic and we, what do you mean your daughter won't marry my son and then they they laugh and they're having fun and um the, he did that entire thing. Again, two different characters, one tall and thin an angular one short and fat and they're they're you know fencing with with the fish <laughs> nice um so yeah he just he changed his style to fit theirs he wasn't just stuck to i can only draw these cartoony characters i can only draw i can only draw animals i can only draw whatever he could do anything and so he continued to draw anything <laughs> he was he did characters in 101 dalmatians he did characters in The Sword and the Stone, Mary Poppins. He was Shere Khan in the Shung- the Shungle Book. The Jungle Book. <laughs> I love the Shungle Book, man. Yes. It's classic stuff. Uh, the Aristocats. Of course, it's a bunch of cats. He did several of the cats. Uh, he did characters in Bedknobs and Broomsticks in the animated sequence there. He was the supervising animator on The Sheriff of Nottingham in Robin Hood. I'm very happy I didn't say Robin Hood, because I almost <laughs> did. Uh and uh, yeah, stepping back a little bit, uh, he, be, he his first time where he was allowed to be a director of the entire film was, uh, or for the entire feature, was Winnie the Pooh and Tigger 2 in 1970. Wow. So he's done all of these characters for so long. He's been a supervising animator, and now he's a director of a feature. He directed the compilation film, The Many Adventures of Winnie the Pooh, which combines several of the Winnie the Pooh uh shorts that had come up before and he co-directed the rescuers which released in 1977 Um, i say co-directed because after 41 years in the disney studios john lounsbury did not retire he passed away of heart failure oh man during production of the rescuers um february 13th of 1976 at the age of 64 John was the first and the youngest of the nine old men to pass away. Ugh. Ruthless. Yeah. 
but that meant he spent his entire career at the Disney Studios. Amazing. 41 years animating, doing what he loved. Uh, he was named a Disney legend in 1989. Uh, this is old hat if you've been paying attention to all of these because all of Walt's not old men were named Disney legends the same year. Uh, the second group of legends, um, they were named legends at the same time as Ub Iwerks. Uh, he was the only nine old the only member who wasn't a one of the nine old men who was named a legend that year. Uh, but yeah, I'll, I'll keep mentioning this every time we do this. Cause you know, you it's, got to, it's, it's part yeah, of it. I've got yeah. it. Yeah. Very good, Eric. Uh, let's see. So there's not a ton about Lounsbury because he died in the seventies. There aren't all of these nostalgic interviews with him. Like you get with a lot of other animators. He never wrote a book. He never, was on a DVD extra commentary right, or, thing or a podcast, a podcast. Yeah. <laughs> right. But that was him. He got his work done. He went home. Um, my final quotes here from Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnston's 1981 book, the illusion of life. Uh, they wrote that uh, hardly subtle. John's characters were always fun to watch his better drawings and bigger concept were not limited by old vaudeville acts. They brought the bold, crude approach to new heights using more refinement, more dramatic angles, more interest, and all without losing the main idea. His simple staging, appealing characters, good taste, strong squash and stretch. This is a, this is, these are very long sentences. And controlled anticipations that followed through making a bold statement, but they never lost believability. Hardly subtle. Always fun to watch. Wow. There is a lot <laughs> of science to animation. You yeah, know, science and art typically don't really mesh well, I think, but they're, you know, they're, they're they're different, right? Right. But in animation, just hearing that quote really sort of highlights that. Yeah. You know, taking it, working on new angles to still provide emotion, you know, that's it's not easy to do. No, definitely not. And yeah, you think of Disney movies and you know that they, we all know that they defined animation in yeah. so many ways. Right. And there's so many cartoons that you watched. You're like, oh, it's, it's fine. It's not Disney, but you know, <laughs> that's that's how it goes. That This is part of it. It's these amazing yeah. animators who figured it out. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. We're going to take a quick break. We're going to come back. I have a lot of news to talk about. Ooh. There's a lot been going on the past couple of days. So we got to go talk about that. So hang on, everyone. It's ears up. We'll be right back. And now, back to the show that's more fun than waiting in line for Peter Pan on a hot August Anaheim day. Ears up. Oh, what's up, everybody? All right, we got some news here to plug, but first... I gotta do something. Hold on a second. Uh -oh. I, didn't get it. I didn't get it ready. Um, no. Ah, whatever. Um, our friends at the 20... What is in my glass? I've been trying to see what's in this. That's what's going on. Oh, whatever. Who cares? Hopefully it's nothing. Uh, our friends at the 21st Amendment want to remind you about drinking the summer. Summer in a can. 21st Amendment. They have this series of beers called Hell or High. Insert fruit of your choice here. I still have some of the mango, the Hell or High mango. Mm. Uh, but Hell, Hell or High watermelon is sort of like the one that took the country by storm. And I'm going to say that. And Sully hasn't told me to say this, but I'm saying it anyway. Because it's true. There really weren't a whole lot of well-made fruit beers for a while, but the folks at the 21st Amendment have figured out how to do that and do it well. And they brew an American style wheat beer, which is still soft and, you know, easy drinking, pleasant drinking, but uh, just sweet enough to really kind of deal with the whatever fruit they're putting in, either the mango, especially, or the watermelon. And it's this really easy drinking. It feels like summer in a can. It's delicious check it out or if you can't find it they have uh their back in black I, black ipa they have a whole bunch of other ipas out there so check them out 21st amendment and if you are in the bay area which you know you got to come and visit every once in a while they have a beer garden at their giant brewery in san leandro or they have uh their smaller uh sort of pilot system i suppose in san francisco at 563 second street which is around the corner from giant stadium so you can catch a game while you're Hanging out, drinking some 2 and a beer. So check them out. Uh, they're good people. They're making good beer, and they support podcasts like us. Thank you. And much. cans. And cans. Yes. Um. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Man, I, haven't, I had another story, too, but I might save it. 
might save it. There's been a lot going on in my life. Saving it for an, an in-depth? Yeah, maybe. Why can't I find my news? Is this it? Yeah, this is it. Uh -huh. What is this? Oh, it's clickbait news. Good <laughs> Lord, Petros, what is going on? It sounded newsy. Back to the newsroom on In-Depth. Nope, that's not it. <laughs> hey, I'm on In-Depth, everybody. Yeah. Here it is. Good Lord. March in the past. Oh, that's the one. And future with all the news that's fit to cover. It's the ears of Disney news. I'm telling you, man, my <laughs> vibes are all off today. <laughs> but I, but I talked about an old man. That's true. You sure did, man. It wasn't me. Ron DeSantis says oh, meatball okay. run i'm not gonna call him meatball run okay ron DeSantis says his deranged vendetta against disney basically saved america <laughs> the yep. florida governor also claims he quote won the battle against the company despite the fact that the federal lawsuit is pending <laughs> this is from vanity fair uh, uh ultimately disney decided guy. that it had enough of um of, uh, of Ron DeSantis and Sue DeSantis and members of his administration for alleged, alleging a, quote, targeted campaign of government retaliation for, quote, expressing a political viewpoint unpopular with certain state officials. The lawsuit is still currently pending, yet such details didn't stop the Florida governor and the 2024 presidential hopeful <laughs> from claiming in a recent interview that not only had he won the battle, but his campaign of retribution had basically saved America. Speaking with family leader, president, and CEO Bob Vander Plaats, DeSantis declared, quote, A lot of these old guard Republicans were telling me that somehow Disney, when they called the shots, you just got to bend the knee. We fought back against Disney. We had a big battle with them, and we won the battle against Disney, he added. I'll tell you, the fact that we were willing to stand up to Disney, that had reverberations across this country. Because I think you do have some CEOs that they're not necessarily bought into this agenda, but it's the path of least resistance. Now they can say, well, gee, I don't want to end up like Disney. People may fight back from the right now. So I think we helped kind of refocus business and America in a better way. I think it was going off the rails. It doesn't matter if you're bought into, you know, whatever the agenda you're talking about, that quote unquote woke agenda it doesn't matter. If you're bought into it or not, it just matters what you, you know, what you do and how you support the people who you find important, whether your employees or your family or whatever. You don't have to believe in it, but just let people do what they want. Oh man. Anyway, yeah. whatever. I thought it was really funny. <laughs> that's, man that's saved America. Great. Yeah, he won a lawsuit that hasn't even been decided yet. Right. <laughs> that, Nothing's yeah, so done. There you go. <clears throat> meanwhile, meanwhile, the the ethics commissioner that um, broke the rules of the ethics commission by being appointed to the $400,000 a year job being in charge of the former uh, Reedy Creek district. Um, I can't remember his name right now, but uh, it, the, the guy who was in charge of an ethics commission and realized that he was breaking the rules of his own job, yeah. getting put into the high profile, high paying job, uh, and got dumped off of the ethics commission so that he could stay in the high paying job. He says the morale has never been better around the Disney, uh, around these offices. Everybody sure. loves, everybody loves them being in charge. And obviously that's true. Yeah. Obviously that's true. That, that was, that was a uh, story over the weekend. I love it. I don't have it pulled up. I can't cite it like you. Oh, yeah. Uh, no, I, fact, I, re but... I remember all these things. Oh, uh, speaking of things <laughs> that um, need to have stay in the in the distant past, in the memory, and not come to fruition, mm -hmm. Disney something called Disney Pinnacle is preparing to be the oh, next no. big NFT failure. <laughs> this is from The Verge. And I read this the other day, and I was like, oh, God. Basically, I, Disney is getting back into NFTs, but licensing their stuff. They're not actually directly doing it, which is smart. 
Disney will launch a all new socially driven collectible experience. That is a quote, a quote, all new socially driven collectible experience called Disney Pinnacle later this year, which it's November. There's not much later this year left, dog. Turning characters from Pixar, Star Wars, and its classic animated films into traditional pins. Digital, excuse me, into tr- tradable digital pins. I was going to say traditional NFT pins. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's an NFT, but you get a physical copy of your NFT. Uh, the Disney Pinnacle website has a wait list for interested traders and collectors. However, it doesn't explain what the digital pins are actually like or why the company would bother to create a verifiable digital hoard. While announcing Pinnacle, Disney and its partner Dapper Labs won't even say the word NFT, mainly because it's not a word. Dapper Labs still calls itself the NFT company, but between a variety of scams, an eye-blistering episode at a recent Bored Ape event, and a market that has plunged since peaking in early 2021, that is a term they apparently will steer clear of. The only thing available on the site right now is a privacy policy that makes clear that this is a Dapper Labs effort that is licensing content from Disney, not an all in-house effort on the level of Disney+. Plus. The NFT collection is being launched through an iOS app, and that web and Android applications will come later. They're in such a hurry to do it. They're only developing an app for half of the cell phone market. <laughs> like there, You know what I mean? It's just half of the people can get it. We'll see well, how it goes. They did lay know. off most of the NFT part portion of the company when Iger came back didn't they I thought so yeah yeah it was like the uh not nft but it was the uh like the the web 3.0 like oh yeah the whole VR yeah. people yeah yeah right yeah. right interesting I still don't know what nfts are it, and... it is it's a it's a picture that may or may not increase in value probably won't and easily can be stolen sounds it great. sounds it sounds awesome right digital god pins. bless the blockchain Dude, um, there are reasons to believe Dapper Labs can get things off to a good start. It did that with NBA Top Shot in 2020, as well as with earlier projects like Crypto Kitties. I've heard neither of those. Um, anyway, uh, in 2017, flipping Crypto Kitties was hot with millions of dollars in sale. Now, Crypto Kitties is remembered for its spectacular fall, while a channel for interested buyers in its official Discord has had messages from three people since September. (laughs) Um, Yeah. Notable. So NFTs are there. People are trying. I don't know why they're trying to make NFTs a thing, but they're not a thing. Nobody cares. Nobody wants them. Um, The board eight people found a niche uh, with people too much money to burn and they created a culture around it. But I just, I don't, I don't know. That's burned out too, hasn't it? No. I, no, it hasn't. Oh. Well, I, I think a lot of things, a lot of the apes have lost their money, but they're still doing more of like, a, that was referenced in that article. They had a, some uh, event or whatever last weekend, and they just had these weird like UV, la- these weird lasers, but the UV rating wasn't good or something. I don't really know the details, but it ended up in like burning people's eyes. <laughs> it's just terrible. Wow. Yeah. Okay. I don't know what's going on. Yeah. All right. I like it. If you're looking for something to burn your eyes and your ears, Eric, Disney <laughs> apparently am. has Frozen 4 in development. I, I saw this. It's like half a comment from Iger. <laughs> I don't it, know, maybe, maybe we'll do four. Maybe we'll do seven. I don't know. There, is, there are so many articles written about this. <laughs> Uh, quote, well, I'll give you a little surprise there. Michael, apparently he says he's getting an interview. He says Frozen 3 is in the works and there might be a Frozen 4 in the works too. Oh, uh, Robin Gibbons and Michael Strahan. Good morning, America. Um, so Iger is in Hong Kong Disneyland talking about the world of Frozen theme, mm-hmm. uh, themed land, which is opening on November which 20th. Looks, which looks awesome. It does. And, you know, I, I, God, I saw an article. I forget where it was from now, but it was, uh, I want to say it was those you register, but it was like, you want to get a look at what the frozen land could have looked like for Disneyland or, or if it comes to Disneyland, this is what it'll look like. And it's just pictures of the Hong Kong one, but it's like, oh, this was pitched in 2017 or whatever for Disneyland forward. But okay. I, please. We don't need, we don't need a frozen. We don't need a frozen land. I would be so mad 
if a new land comes up and it's like themed like this like i really want them to go back to just vibe themes you like frontier land or you know something else and not ip land so you're Fill telling the me blank land i don't like they, that. they buy all of the hotels across harbor and they put in a frozen land you're not going no of course i'm gonna go oh okay but i won't like it <laughs> and every time i go i'll be m- more unhappy uh see Iger didn't say much about sequel plans for the oscar winning frozen franchise though he did add quote but jen lee who created frozen the original frozen and frozen 2 is hard at work with her team at disney animation on not one but actually two stories a little scoop he adds a little scoop giving you a little scooper a little scooperino two stories but it doesn't necessarily mean there's a four but maybe there is a four i don't know who cares there's gonna be a four frozen four coming out coming soon coming tomorrow yeah why not? right now yeah, we'll write it right now. I'd rather have a Frozen 4 than Frozen live action. Yeah, it'll happen. It'll happen. It's inevitable. <laughs> it's inevitable. Um, There's an interview with The Rock, and he was on some talk show, and he said he's, like, literally shooting it right now. The live the action Moana. Moana, yeah. And I'm like, oh, God. That does seem awfully, we don't awfully swift. It. it really does. We don't need it. For we don't need that it. I still watch with frequency <laughs> i was thinking about this I'm, I'm finishing up the ahsoka series on disney plus star mm-hmm. wars and um because i i just i can't it moves so slow man but uh, you know molten glass moves faster than this show uh but i like the aesthetics Fair. i'm i'm trying to <laughs> I'm trying to keep it up trying to keep up with it yeah and i realized like what other franchises have tried to expand their universe and every time they expand it the draw for that expansion is less and less. You know, you look at like Ghostbusters tried to do this. They failed miserably, I think. Uh, Frozen, I think, is obviously trying to do this. There's like, you know what I mean? You, you see where I'm going with this. Like Star Wars, I feel like why, and I'm not going to go too far into it because I go through this all the time, but like Star Wars worked because it you used your imagination for what these things meant. Mm-hmm. And then as they had to expand and expand the universe, they had to describe what these things meant and it was no longer cool and then they had to just invent stuff that directly contradicts edicts laid forth in the original films and it's like well now what's going on that's all confusing and now now nothing means anything anymore like just literally nothing means anything and it's like okay well that's cool i mean the first off uh ghostbusters afterlife was a delight (laughs) i really liked it it was fine. I get. I mean, I didn't see it, so I. I'm, oh, okay, I know they're making okay. another. I know they're making another one. I saw the trailer and it was like, okay, um, but um, it, but my point is, it's not. It it, it it was nowhere near the enjoyment that the first one gave people. Possibly, it was yeah, nowhere could, near that. Yeah, yeah, I could I could probably say that. There's a lot of nostalgic value that fits into it. Star Wars has done what they've been doing with things like Ahsoka is they're building toward when. When Disney came in and wiped the slate clean of all of the now the now Star Wars legends, all of the books and comic books that all of us nerds were reading and collecting for so many years between between the original trilogy and the prequel trilogy, where we were other people were imagining things and we're like, yes, we're on board. We re- heir to the Empire. Yeah, I'm in. Like, I I want to. This Thrawn guy seems awesome, and now they're kind of going well we did wipe the slate clean but we kind of really like some of the stories that were out there so we really want to bring them back in <laughs> uh, so for my part i'm i'm totally on board and ahsoka might have been slow paced it is slow paced but it was brilliantly shot and it brings in characters from recent cartoons that i really liked and it brings in characters from books that I really liked and it's bringing in some of these major concepts these like deep deep force concepts that I'm I'm sure anybody other than RGH and the Bantha Milk guys and I probably didn't like anybody other than us uh, on this network probably won't get the end shots of Ahsoka Um, but I welcome and, you all to listen to Bantha Milk and understand what was going on at the very end of the show. Well, which I haven't seen yet, so don't say anything. But right. yeah, I don't want to. Yeah, I don't want to go and, there. And I guess that's my point: is that 
Star Wars, when it came out, didn't do this kind of like, you know, playing either secrets or playing to a certain kind of audience or doing fan service because it didn't really need to. And mm-hmm. then the, the, the subsequent movies like uh, Return of the Jedi and Empire Strikes Back, those didn't do fan service to the first one either. It just continued the story in a linear fashion. But True. now you have these, you have to do these little tricks of like, oh, let's plant this or whatever. And it's like, yeah. all I'm trying to do is figure out that if there's a spaceship that shoots a laser blast <laughs> in space and it doesn't hit anything, how long does it travel until it hits something? That's all I'm trying to figure out. If you can answer me that, this please, what, somebody answer me this. so upsetting to you. This has been, I t- I'm telling you, this has been a thing in my brain for decades <laughs> because you see this tie fighter and you go, oh and then you hear like stray bullets or whatever you know because we live in uh the world we live in where there's a lot of uh you know gunfire and um, hey entropy still exists in space d- d- i don't know does it i've always i've always you know been taught that like and then so then it, it just slows down eventually because there's resistance of you know solar wind or whatever but and it just sit there it's just floating like it keeps laser flying bolt and- the the bolts keep flying until they hit Star Trek. <laughs> oh, okay, I'm all right with yeah. that then. All That's right. why there's only three seasons of it. Um. Anyway, there you go. Let's do some park news. What do you think of that? Okay. Apparently, Disney has reined in, quote, professional pin traders who bring thousands of collectible pins to the Anaheim theme park by extremely limiting the amount of time, number of pins, and trading locations where the decades-old cherished Disney tradition is permitted. First of all, it is not cherished. <laughs> The only people who cherish it are people who are like, you know, really excited about a new season of uh, Loki. You know what I mean? Like nobody cares. Most people do not care about it. I just decided to make fun of Loki. Um, It's fine. I haven't seen the new one. I don't know. And me. It's fine. It's fine. Yeah. Um, But like decades old cherished Disney tradition. Yeah. I, I yeah. seeing seeing them there was always a little off putting because it would always be it. It, it would always be a few guys who just have this big old this giant bag oh. uh, this huge display set up right inside frontierland which is weird enough because it was inside it was always just inside frontierland and this crowd of people is standing around looking at all the stuff that they had like yeah, it feels kind of weird i mean it, 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 it was one thing that disney let them do it for so long i'm surprised that they let them go that long me too and I, doing I, something about right it. and i thought about it uh sort of off the tales of uh in depth where they're banning um uh, in disney world they're banning third-party tour guides oh have you heard I that i didn't see that one but yeah like I they're can... they're like literally pulling people out of line and saying you're a tour guide we know you are here's a have this uh disney property ban for a hmm. year interesting yeah okay uh or lifetime bans um because it's it's I would think it's conducting commerce in the parks and you're not allowed right. to do that. So I don't yeah. understand how they're allowed to to do that because maybe the 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 give and take on there is like well they're they're encouraging people to go in and buy pins which is why they're doing it near a pin trading area where you can uh, not pin trading but where you can go buy pins like the the shop in front yeah, of the that's, land right that's there. the main pin shop. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe there's that but like I just I I didn't like them they were always uncomfortable and they're taken to the benches. Go away! True. Don't 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 do it. But um, Jason loves the bench. I love a bench. Uh, this is yeah. from uh, Disneyland. It says we regularly evaluate and adjust our policies and operations. Pin trading is a fun. Oh Jesus, Eric! Pin trading is a fun magical activity for our guests. It's magical. I don't know about magical. Yeah, it is kind of fun when you find a thing that you're looking for. And you're like, oh, I like this shape. And these updated guidelines will create a designated location near Westward Ho Trading Company in Disneyland Park during specific times, which will enhance the overall guest experience at Disneyland Resort. So pin trading displays are now permitted only in the, quote, extremely limited, ex- excuse me, extremely limited designated trading area near Westward Ho. Use of the trading area is restricted to specific times between park opening and 3 p.m. daily. Pin huh. traders are permitted to bring only one pin trading bag measuring 14 by 12 inches by 6 inches to the park and cannot use lights or signs. This people people wonder you see like um, you know restrictions and rules for anything and you go well someone must have done something to make somebody else write this law down of like you can't use lights or signs. These freaks were sitting there with lights and signs. 
in Disneyland. Uh, oh, I, I haven't God. seen any of that, but it makes me think of like the people that are just outside the gates when you're heading when you're heading out at <laughs> yeah. night, and they're like flinging the, little like, helicopter, gyroscope yeah, the helicopter or things, yeah, yeah, dude. <laughs> oh man, I and it, yeah, that is very specific. Um, but I, I, I'm not. I guess the question is why now? Why? Well, why right, right now? Well, Eric, they frequently review their guidelines to provide a good guest experience who knows i don't know i mean i think maybe maybe they weren't allowed or maybe they weren't coming back after the parks opened after lockdown and then now that they're coming back people are like dude this sucks i don't want because i don't re- i've only seen them maybe a handful of times i love frontierland so i'm there all the time whenever i go so i don't really see them for a while so maybe it's not really like a, a we don't really hit the weekends and maybe they're more like weekend people yeah yeah I, i'm i'm trying to think yeah there are definitely times where i haven't seen anybody there and yeah it's something weird for me because it, as a walt disney world guy no you you pin trade with cast members you don't pin trade with like people um Right. I mean, you're encouraged to do to do trades with cast members. Right. You know, but um, and, and that's, that's coming back I, in Walt Disney World now, too. That's the way it should be, man. I don't know. Whatever. Who cares? Yeah. Speaking of uh, other stuff that uh, I actually care about this, I'm actually really disappointed. Beast's Library, which is over in uh, DCA at the Imagination Campus, will be closing permanently on December 10th. If you're hitting the parks anytime soon, man, you gotta go there now. I loved Beauty and the Beast, uh, Beast Library. It was awesome. It was fun. Everything was me. broken half the time. It was like the House of the Future, House of Tomorrow, or whatever, where just nothing really worked all that well. Um, but it was a cute little space. I don't know. It was like it was neat. I liked it. Uh, I'm sorry. I said it was located at Disney's Imagination Campus, which is a ridiculous thing to say because it's not. Disney's Imagination Campus, which is an educational program that teaches students how to use their imagination to solve various challenges, will take over the space. Our plan is for Imagination Campus to use the Beast's Library space moving forward, and the final day for guests to experience Beast's Library will be December 10th. Uh, It's tucked away inside the Sorcerer's Workshop in the Hollywood land of DCA. The famous prince portrait hangs in the middle of the room, and guests can watch as it changes to the Claude version, just like it did in the animated film. Never seen it. I've never, never You're... gone further. I've I've never done that. Oh, my... yeah. I've been in the Goodness. lobby, and I've never gone further in. I don't know why. You you've all talked about it so much, and I've just never been in there. I'm sorry, everybody. Sorry, sorry. You should be. It's cute. Yeah, uh, and then they talk about pin yeah. trading. This is interesting. This is I I did not know this. Pin trading was introduced to Disneyland and Walt Disney World in late 1999 after former Disneyland Resort president George Caligridis observed the activity during a trip to the 1998 Winter Olympics in Nagano, Japan. He saw that pin trading allowed visitors worldwide to interact and communicate even if they didn't speak the same language. Look at that. My Greek mm. boy. My big special round Greek boy. <laughs> oh, um, I want to sign in. Apparently, it's on Twitter. People are like talking about it, of course, because why not? Don't you mean X? <laughs> no, the last <laughs> thing I mean is X. I'll be honest with you. Um, have you been keeping up with? We only have a couple of news stories, guys, and that's it. A couple left. Okay. Uh, have you been keeping up with the uh, Cotino? That storytelling by Disney thing that's going on in Rancho. Mirage, Palm Springs. <laughs> yeah, near Palm Springs, basically. <laughs> have you been keeping up with that at all? Not a ton. I, I haven't seen, un, until recently, it, it kind of vanished from the news. Yeah, there hasn't really been too many updates. They uh, they did, they released a 20-minute video with uh, Brett I- Irwin, the voice of Mickey Mouse. Oh. And he sort of explains, in the Disney way, literally nothing, but like shows th- people walking and talking but there's the no information it's like this is how we imagine this is our inspiration he's not doing the mickey voice is he no and at at no point do they say he's the voice of mickey mouse what who he is or what he does oh wow he's like sitting at his desk and he's like this is my desk as you can see i'm kind of a big disney fan it's like i know because you're the voice of me why aren't we what, what are we doing it's very odd and and, and uncomfortable for me but whatever I, I'm, um, I'm kind of interested to watch it now because i imagine his voice is like hello i'm the I voice put it, of mickey Mouse. i put it in the discord it's weird 
It's weird. I'll have to go back and look at it. I missed that one. Um, but apparently the first prices of the houses in Disney's Catino have hit the market, and you're looking at upwards of over a million dollars for homes and $20,000 to join the club. Does anyone want to buy my house four times? <laughs> <laughs> I'll move in there for for you, the listeners. If you pay for my yes, house, yes, I will four live stream times. every day. Right, <laughs> uh, Cotino is continuing to slowly take shape with home prices announced this week, starting north of one million dollars. And if you want to be a member of that swanky clubhouse inspired by the Pixar's incredible films, it'll cost twenty grand to join and eleven grand a year after that. Now, I can't think of two <laughs> things that are more incongruent than swanky and Incredibles. I don't I don't see that I don't see that that design aesthetic being applied to a place where you have to spend eleven thousand dollars a year to be a part of. I don't I that doesn't mean anything to me. That makes no sense to me. I, I mean I definitely want to be part of it because it sounds really great. But not because like that, it has to do with the Incredibles. Like if they just made it a Club thirty three like clone, that would have been, I guess, worth it. But yeah, but, but Incredibles, I mean the, like a total mid mod? Yeah, I mean, yeah, oh, maybe, I'm in. Maybe, maybe. I don't know. Hopefully, they they understood that the whole aesthetic of the Incredibles is based on mid-century modern. I don't know, man. I just whatever. Uh, but, yeah, that's, you're right. Yeah, it's a lot. It's slated to eventually have nearly two thousand homes and condos on long vacant land just east of Bompo Drive between Frank Sinatra and Gerald Ford Drives. Again, two people that are couldn't be more incongruent: Frank Sinatra, Gerald Ford. Uh, both, the initial both phase... my favorite presidents. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, the initial phase will include more than 300 homes, or about 15% of the total property, um, you know, yada, yada, yada. So the smallest yeah. home sites, known as the Cottage Collection, include three different floor plans with a one- and two-story models ranging from roughly 2,200 feet to 2,800 square feet. Um. Prices for those homes. So these are the smallest home sites are expected to start from the upper one millions. Uh, Tino officials announced this week. To Prices for the the desert. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, which is fine, but like you're 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 paying up the upper one millions for a twenty two hundred square feet small house. Yeah, my house is Maybe bigger worth than it. that. Right. <laughs> Uh, prices for, I mean, it's hard to, to get an, um, anyway, uh, prices yeah. for the grand collection, which includes four different floor plans ranging from about 2,700 square feet to 3,700 square feet will begin from the quote, low two millions. The prices Ooh. fall on the upper end of the housing market in Rancho Mirage. Census data show the city's median home value is $570,000. Yeah, that's it, man. Ooh, okay yeah that's wild that that's, is so wild that's some 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 dollars some ducats um okay two more and they're both pretty good All scarlett right. johansson apparently is doing a live action tower of terror movie okay i want, I want you to let that sink in for a little bit the Tower of Terror, the thing that they have already removed from Disneyland. I don't even know if it's in Disney World anymore. It sure is. They um they're good they they don't want it to be a ride in Disneyland, but they want it to be a movie. So there you go. It's a uh, her movie adaptation of Disney's Tower of Terror ride. It's still in development apparently. Uh she broke the news on the Today show that the long in development movie is about the terrifying Disney Park attraction will be up and running very soon. Oh, so I imagine they almost uh, think that it's uh, script is done and they're going to start shooting now that the writer's strike is over. OK, yeah, they've been talking about that for a long time. I didn't know she was attached to it. Uh, yeah, I don't. Um... Can we just get Gutenberg back? Steve Gutenberg, get, I would get love back that. the original cast. The project nearly fell apart in 2021 when Johansson sued at Disney over the hybrid release of Marvel's Black Widow. Uh, you know, blah, blah, blah. Yes, we all remember that. Yeah, massive <laughs> um, screw up. And then last but not least, now this is something I didn't know about. Um, 
I this is the first thing I've heard of this. The Museum of the Weird Candleman figure is joining the Haunted Mansion at Walt Disney World. Are you familiar with Candleman? Oh, the Candleman is creepy as hell. Yeah, I love that's what that's one of Rolly's, right? Yeah. Designed by legendary Imagineer Rolly Crump, the Candleman figure was deemed too scary to go into the original Haunted Mansion. I don't think that was the reason and was instead planned to go into a never realized Museum of the Weird exhibit at the Haunted Mansion. The demon-like ghostly figure is made of dripping wax and can be found in Magic Kingdom's Haunted Mansion attic scene on the left side of the forward motion. Whatever that means. That's a weird way of putting that. It is. And so here's a picture, a, pi- a picture of it. Picture, um, okay. I'm trying to get I'd, one take, like I'd take Candleman is. over Hatbox any day. Like, Are you kidding me? Of course, dude. I would take the whole entire Museum of the Weird over most of the <laughs> new things that they've done. So there's uh, the attic scene in Disney World, and there's Candleman right there. And he's just, you know, he's like... I don't know. What do you think? Six inches? Oh, very, very tiny. But oh, he's just on a little nightstand or whatever. There's a candelabra and then there's some like, uh, you know, roses. And then it looks like a suit of armor next to it. Um, and then right in between there, there's a little candleman guy. So he's literally already in there. He still looks creepy as hell. But yeah, I was, I was hoping for a little, a little more zhuzh on that. <laughs> there he is. Yeah, I wish he was. Uh, I wish he was a little bit taller. I wish he was a baller. <laughs> it's cool. I mean, the cool photos of the attic, you know? Oh, yeah. It's like the same photo over and over and over again. So I was like, wow, that's really cool. Good job for Florida for getting that. So I messaged my uh, my friends who happen, you know, my imaginary friends. <clears throat> um, I was like, did oh. you guys see this? This is really cool because they're like big rolly you know, people and they're like, dude, that's been in Disneyland for like two months. And I said, no, it's not. Shut up, Brian. You're not supposed to know that. I'm supposed to be telling you things. So there he is <laughs> in the Haunted Mansion um, <laughs> overlay. So he's right by in the attic scene. I think that's where that is. Yeah. Or like the big coiled snake by his coils uh, to the right of that. Right. There's a candelabra and he's right in between. Um, he's right in between there. So they made two of these. And they just, well, that's a different looking one than, than in Florida. And there's a little uh, tag around it. And Aww. it says, it says Rolly on it. It's a gift for Rolly. Yeah. A little tag on his foot. It was just, I like it. Such a sweet addition. But yeah, it looks cool. I love it. I think it's yeah. great. And it's funny because for the past few years, actually, ever since I saw it, so maybe, I don't know, five, six years ago, I was like, I want to get that as a tattoo. Mm. That'd be cool, man. Oh, that would be a good tattoo. Is it? Is it the same? Is it different? I'm. I wonder if. Oh, it's... oh, you know. Oh, it's just something from that you're seeing through it. It might be the same. Oh, right there. Yeah. Yeah. It's, there's just it's some empty red in the it. center. Yeah, yeah, but I wonder if it's just the same mold. No, it looks completely. It does yeah, look. It does it look a little different. different. I like it. Good. I'm glad cool. that they did that. I'm glad that instead of just like making it the same, they they uh yeah whatever <laughs> they just ran two through the 3d printer basically yeah <laughs> tossed them in there um yeah neat huh i thought you might like that i had no idea i had no idea that it was in disney disneyland and i was I like how do you guys know this and they've like i, it's, I have not seen a single story about yeah. it although different brian in the chat is brian, brian Soro is saying that he knew about it of course he did and i just why i yelled at him brian. i said you're not supposed to know that shut up Wait, i'm you, supposed you, to be telling you things is this the same brian how many Brian's? How many do Brian? You know? We have one Brian in the chat. Okay. Oh, he's telling you. I thought you were saying a different Brian. No. You know, a, an Imagineer Brian. No. Okay. I do not. Thanks, Brian. But if any Imagineers <laughs> named Brian want to be my friend, I'll, I'll be friends with anybody. Yeah. I don't care. Okay. What do I got to lose? Mm-hmm. What do I got to lose except my ID and a job? Yeah. So mad. Make sure you uh, cancel your social security card <laughs> i only send pictures of my uh <laughs> my id so i i'm all right i think but um and that that one very distinctive mole well yeah you know yeah yeah and my w- christmas wish list speaking of christmas let me turn this music <laughs> off sorry speaking <laughs> of christmas what i'm doing is i am putting together a few i'm doing a giveaway doing a few giveaways. oh yeah 
I want to tell you guys this real fast. So for I'm doing two separate giveaways, one specifically for Patreon people. And all you have to do is just be a Patreon member. And I will do a couple, maybe a couple of drawings. I haven't really figured out exactly how many things I'm going to give away. It's probably going to be at least five prize packs across either the social channels or Patreon only. But Patreon people, you are going to get the better one. You are going to get uh, your own specific one. So if you want to be a part of that and you're a Patreon supporter, all you have to do is just keep being a Patreon supporter. And that that's literally it. And enjoy all the content. And of course, you know, leave us five stars everywhere you go <laughs> on the rating sites. Um, but if you want to, uh, if you don't want to be a Patreon because you can't do it or, you know, you think the content sucks, but you just have nothing else to do. So you listen to it anyway. That's fine. Uh, I'm going to be releasing some information on social probably next week about how to participate in those. It's probably going to be the standard like this post and or whatever. But I also want to do a little bit of interaction. So it might be like, tell me your favorite holiday story at Disneyland or something like that. There's going to be some sort of work to it. You got to give me some content and then I will bestow upon you potentially a nice little gift pack. We have uh, I have some shirts, some churro shirts that were screen printed uh, that are still before we transitioned to a uh, drop shipping that I still have. I have some stickers. I have some books. I have some posters that our friend miles at modeling Disney gave to me for the hundredth episode, actually, I think. And I just found them along with a bunch of other swag from the, uh, from the hundredth episode, like hundredth episode, uh, those little cheap nylon backpacks, <laughs> the uh, posters that we made up that are just like a uh, rock and roll poster size, like from the Fillmore or whatever, if anybody knows that. Um, stuff like that, you know, just stuff, odds and ends that I got around the house. So, uh, you know, check it out. I think it's going to be great. I don't know why I said check it out because you have no place to check it out at, but keep tuned to our socials. I will actually be posting on it and, uh, it's going to be, it's going to be fun. I've, uh, I put a couple clips up from our latest episode of in depth over on our TikTok channel. You can interact. Jeremy, if you hadn't heard that episode, Jeremy has a lot of things to say about luminous. Does check he? That out. Yeah. So, uh, so go That's on TikTok to me. and and check them out, please. Um, and if you like the stuff on TikTok, I'll 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 do more. But anyway, we're doing some giveaways for Christmas. So all this ultimately will be decided upon on the Christmas show. I will do the drawing. I will announce the winner on the Christmas show, and uh, you know it should be a good time. It'll be fun. Santa Iger letters. Santa Jason. I don't know. Whatever. Santa somebody. Yeah. Santa. Santa, somebody. Santa DeSantis. There you go. Oh my God, I wish that'd be so cool. I just, I'm, I'm waiting for someone at those debates to just be like, just take your boot off and give it to me. Just let's go. Just take it off. Take it off. I want to see it. And if you don't, they're lifts and you have to admit it. And that's it. And then he'll grind his go. teeth down to the gums. It'd be fun. All right, everybody. Thank you very much for tuning in. I really appreciate it. If you want to support this show, you can go to our Etsy store, which is uh, etsy.com slash ears up, I think, or something like that. Just search for it. Uh, we have a ton of t-shirts up there. I have another one coming soon. It's going to be good. I, just have, I haven't got the file yet, but it should be up hopefully in time for Christmas. I'm, I'm excited about this one. It's going to be a good one. And, uh, of course, patreon.com slash years up. Join our Patreon area or whatever. It, uh, my brain's working weird, man. <laughs> I've done a thing in Patreon where I'm trying to like group the episodes into different things so you can just search for, uh, where I think it might even just tell you, here are all the Pyramid Eye the Ear shows. Or here are all the cool people doing cool things shows. Or here are all the puny pod shows. So you don't have to like physically search in the thing for them, right? Mm, okay. They made it a little easier now, so I'm trying that out. Um, anyway, that's it for me, everybody. And uh, Eric, thank you very much for your hard work. I appreciate you. Thank you. It oh, was you're fun. welcome. Yeah. All right, everybody. Thanks a lot. And uh, until next time, we'll see you in the parks. Good night.